Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast on the internet that has the science and the screaming to determine what is the single greatest movie of any given year. Longtime listeners, for like two weeks or so, will know that this year is 1982 and we are about to dive into Woo. actual movies. If you are a short time listener, let me tell you that I am going to bring on two contestants and they will compete by arguing, talking about, discussing, and reviewing this movie so good and winning my affection so well that they will actually get points for that and the winner will become my OTP. <gasps> yeah, you know me. <laughs> Our first contestant is the one, the only, the winner of last season, uh, Mike. Ryan, you old handsome so-and-so, how the fuck are you? Uh, I'm doing good, Mike. I almost gave you a point, but uh, we're not there yet. Oh, there's points right now? I didn't even know. <laughs> Did you not know that? <laughs> You're just looking trim and slim and ready to get some uh, trim. Mike. That's that's a point for Mike. Um, handsomeness? Not something to care about. Born with this face, I'll die with this face. Trim <laughs> trimness? Yeah, talk that up. Probably uh, Greg. Ryan. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> You are looking trim, and you mentioned your face. It is looking thin, especially. You have a thin, normal-sized head and face, and that's that's good. That's this, what you feels, this is just stealing Mike's thunder. Mike. This is uh, this is disgusting so far. I was uh, just trying to ride in on his coattails. I know, and you don't lose a point, but in the like the zero sum game of things, you do lose a point. I still yeah. rode in on those coattails, though, and it felt pretty good. Yeah. It was like skitching. You're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, <laughs> I had all my rollerblades. I was hanging on to them. fun as hell. 1982, Ge everybody's rollerblading. Gentlemen, tonight is 48 hours, and I know that sounds confusing. It's a long day. Tonight's going to be like 12 hours, like every other night. But tonight <laughs> we're discussing the film 48 Hours. Uh, we have so much to go over. It's going to be a long show. It's, it, this show might be longer than the movie, this 96-minute movie. Oh, Gorgeous but loved that runtime. Before we dive into it, and Mike, I'm going to start with you. What do we think? Did you did you have a good time at the theater this week? We have a theater in the studio, yeah. uh, bigger than any theater that our audience has ever been to. The speakers are so loud, it hurts, but you got to use them to their full strength. We put in a lot of money. Especially those gunshots. Oh, <laughs> loud gunshots in this one. I ha I put in earplugs the way like old people go when you go to a punk rock show. You put in earplugs now. I put in earplugs to watch our movies. <laughs> I love old, movies from this era is uh, guns are the loudest thing ever created. Like yep. they create sonic booms and uh, blood is just uh, red paint for days. I hope kids uh, these days, if, if, if you start making out and hooking up and you're still living with your parents, don't put on a movie from the 80s because you're like, this is just a quiet comedy. There will be a fucking gun battle and your dad will walk in your little dick get a little sucked. <laughs> Land before time, <laughs> gun battle. <laughs> yeah. You gotta watch out, and then uh, then they're like, "Okay, back to the regular scene. Time to whisper to each other." <laughs> whisper so. Meanwhile, it's yeah, <laughs> and it's not just whispering; it's Nick Nolte whispering, which I think shows a little something like this. <laughs> you've so been, do you've been doing that impression, Ryan, for a couple weeks now, and I was like, "That's so over the top." <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, watch the movie Forty Eight Hours and tell me if you can distinguish blindfolded. Ryan doing the impression, or Nick Nolte trying his hardest to do actual acting. Greg. I almost taught the drop pad how to do Nick Nolte, just lines <laughs> from 48 Hours, <laughs> and just have me and it go on, uh, just go off on a Nolte off. Uh, but no, back to the question at hand. Did, Mike, did you like the movie? I loved it. Uh, you loved it. Uh, the only you other loved time it. I, the only other time I've seen it, I was an adult. I was a younger adult, because that's how time works. Mm. Uh, but liked it then, watched it recently like so that was probably five seven years ago enjoyed it then uh yeah man it, eddie murphy's a goddamn star and right now he's just a humorless dr doodle eight phone it in kind of guy and just the, i don't know if anybody else has the charisma young eddie murphy has on screen hey you don't even like think about getting close to him you can just pray that you're allowed to be in the norbit orbit that's where <laughs> he is right that's now. that's what they say that's what everyone says. <laughs> everybody's saying it Greg, l l less than Mike? Uh, yeah, a lot less. This is uh, the only history I have with this is like iconic movie cover that I saw in Blockbuster. And I always thought, like, ah, oh, that must be a comedy. Interesting. <laughs> um, 
I freaking, I hated this movie. I hate it so much. I watched it twice, and I think I maybe hated it less the second time. But especially the beginning of this movie is just awful. And a big part of it is... Do you mean the first 24 minutes without Eddie Murphy? That weird fucking farm scene. I was like, why are we on a farm? Did I start the right movie? And also, like, the the movie is, like, constantly evolving as it goes on, which I... I'm sure, not totally sure if that's the if that's the point or if they were like still finding it constantly. Um, a lot of it doesn't make sense, but it's just it's so unpleasant. Like everybody, <laughs> most scenes start with someone just taking out a gun and firing it, and as we mentioned, it it's so loud. <laughs> um, everybody is so racist. Uh, everybody is like so awful and misogynistic, and it it really doesn't let up for a single scene, and. It's just kind of like gray and boring for a long time. And then it sort of picks up near the end. And then our protagonist sort of learns like, ah, maybe I shouldn't be so racist. I don't know. I'm just a San Francisco cop. But I, one thing I read about it that ma- it helped me make sense of the movie is I read that it was originally supposed to be set in the South. Oh. That kind of helps me understand a little bit more like, it's so weird to go to a hick bar in the middle of San Francisco. Infamously like, cowboy friendly city, yeah. San Francisco. <laughs> You're going to have to go talk to these good old boys here in San Francisco. Watch out for them. But really it's just the, it's, it's kind of humorless. Um, it is very just unpleasant is how I found it. Most of the time, I really just like didn't enjoy my time with it at all and like you get into maybe two minutes of it and then someone says like the bad f word and you're like whoa okay um the racism comes at you like from all angles and it like it's really well read in racism and so like there's all these racist terms that maybe like you don't even hear anymore you're googling google's like whoa whoa buddy you yeah, to be an ancient racist <laughs> well, that, yeah let's we'll get back to that in a second but um yeah the I think this was accidentally the first movie that we covered, um, and which drove me crazy because it looks like we alphabetized by numbers and then letters, and that's not how you're supposed. This this movie starts with an F, uh, in a lot of ways. But uh, <laughs> I'm so glad that this is the first because what a little 1982 nugget we have yeah, on our hands it's to like deal with. Dunked in a 1982 ice bath. <laughs> The one thing I have to say is uh, it, it's a it's a 1982 movie with Eddie Murphy set in San Francisco, and he never like there's never like a scene where he's doing like a flamboyantly over the top gay caricature. And I feel like the first time I watched this movie, I was like grimacing, waiting for that <laughs> to happen the entire time. Not that it's not anti-gay; it totally is, but like it's not in your face anti-gay. I. I'm much closer to Mike on this one. I I think that it's maybe not a great movie. I think it's definitely good at almost everything it does, including being bad. <laughs> uh, but such a fascinating like a time capsule uh, in so many ways, and also like uh, Cracker Jack Entertainment. I think in a lot of ways. Um, we're gonna take a break, and then let's just dive into all of these topics that we just talked about. In the late 70s, a couple of dudes had a dream. What if a white guy and a black guy teamed up together to solve a crime? The plan was set, and Clint Eastwood and Richard Pryor were approached to star. Eventually, Eastwood bowed out, and Pryor became too big of a celebrity. So the people around Paramount eventually had an idea. Use the reworked script as a star vehicle for Nick Nolte. And then cast that new 20-year-old kid from Saturday Night Live. I'll reiterate that last part. Eddie Murphy was 20 (laughs) years old when he filmed 48 Hours. The script went through a couple rewrites, more than a couple, with dialogue changes happening throughout filming. The writers argued the execs hated Eddie's performance, and the movie opened in third place. It went on to be the seventh highest grossing movie of the year and created a star. The story revolves around a cop borrowing a prisoner for 48 hours in order to find a villain, played by James Remar. But ultimately, it's about John Cates and Reggie Hammond, Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy trying to become buds. You buds, I'll ask you this, because I feel like we have to start here. What is this movie trying to do with race, and how does it play today? I honestly do think the thought 
of race in this movie just goes, it exists, right? <laughs> I don't think the writers thought they were commenting on it at all. I disagree. I think that what the I think the point the movie mate is making about race is like, hey man, you know who's like racism is bad for? It's bad for everybody who does it. So let's not do racism anymore. Because if you watch the the first scene, there's the all white chain gang, which is something that uh, happens all the time. Uh, the all white chain gang, and then uh, the. Uh, the Native American fella who walks up and is made as Native American from like 250 yards. The first uh, line yeah, in the got... whole movie. The movie's very quiet for a long time. The first line is fucking racist against him. Yeah. But I do think that scene is about how racism blinds you, right? Mm. Because the cop thinks that he has made an alliance with the uh, the chain gang guy, because the prisoner, because it's right. like we can both be white and make fun of this guy. And that blinds him to the fact that really – they are already in league right uh, and that his life is in danger like and then later that's the same message that nick nolte learns right he learns like how decent uh eddie murphy can be and then he before had been missing out on all like the great things that he could know by prejudging somebody for being a criminal but also a criminal yes uh, i well, i was judging you because you were a convict that's the thing the mo- no other reason the movie near the end kind of does try to do a switcheroo where, like, four scenes after Nick Nolte has turned to Eddie Murphy and said, sorry, I said that racist stuff. I was just trying to do my job keeping you down. Later, he's like, I was judging you for being a convict. No, that's you weren't saying convict stuff right. to him. You were saying racist right. stuff to him. Just using the word convict with a hard T. And it does seem like the, the movie also is pulling back Mike. because the police chief, the, uh, like, platonic... As in Plato, not as in, like this. Plato, he fucks. Uh, he's black <laughs> and also screams convict to Eddie Murphy, and cemented uh, the genre. And, police chief will always just come in and scream, and says, "I don't care if I like. I'll call him an N word. Right. I don't care." That's right. Uh, I said it. Like what? <laughs> fun fact: um, that blustery police chief played the blustery police chief in National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon One and Last Action Hero, nice. two movies that make fun of this movie and many others. So. He got not only typecast, but started parodying himself as soon as well, possible. Well, he was the, the, the origin, right? Isn't this like the first buddy cop movie? Yeah, I mean, like, I think in a lot of ways, if you want to call... Some people have argued that it's not a buddy cop movie by the most technical of terms, but it's it's one badge, two guys, they share the yeah. badge. This is a buddy they cop movie. They literally hand the badge back and forth. Yeah. I, they- <laughs> <laughs> I, I think an interesting thing when it comes to race is we go to... We have two very... I think the movie thinks two very similar scenes in bars. Uh, And I think maybe a modern movie would be more ham-fisted about it than I think this one is. Uh, I was surprised that this could be subtle. Uh, They go into the Hick bar, and Eddie Murphy, he does like throw glasses around, but they try to stab him and shoot him and get so mad at him. And when Nolte goes into the black bar, people are just like, hey, man, uh, you normally don't come here. (laughs) This is, this is, I think, the key is the two bars because... um, if Eddie Murphy and we we have to get to this scene in a couple minutes, like the the I'm an N word with a badge scene is the most legendary mm-hmm. scene from the movie. But um, Eddie Murphy has to elevate his like persona to eleven in order to not be killed, even though he has the badge. Right. Whereas Nick Nolte can go and like reverse the situation and sit at the bar and feel totally comfortable. And Nick Nolte is the kind of guy who would say. I'm not privileged. There's no such thing as oh, white privilege. Sure. <laughs> Motherfucker, look at how comfortable you are in this place as opposed to what Eddie Murphy would feel like if he wasn't at 11. I've never seen any examples of privilege myself. <laughs> <laughs> but th- it's this constant um, like thinking about race and engaging with race. And then at the same time, I think that the movie's like, well, that gives us license to um, like portray racism. And mm. so what we're going to do is we're just going to portray a lot of what we think of as like real life racism. And it's not racist because we're making a commentary on racism. And I think that. But do you think it was played for laughs? A lot of times. Like, I, I, I think that it was played. It was played in whatever direction they needed it to be. That like sometimes it was like we're delivering a social message about race. And sometimes it was just like, yeah, kind of like a weird like gag moments see i totally agree with what you said in the beginning in the intro greg which was the it like i was as uncomfortable as you but i i give that i give the movie points for that yeah everybody's grimy and gross and like by the end of the movie i'm not like i like nick nolte 
<laughs> like everybody kind of they, sucks and they don't try to I watched Shawshank Redemption this fucking week. But see that sounds like that sounds like oh the wow. me, that sounds like the message of a racist that everybody is racist and that everybody's in the mud and that you should like adopt no, that I mindset because that's realistic. Eddie Eddie Murphy is so much is such a better person as the convict cuz a cabs weren't a cabs yet. So as the convict and the black dude, he comes out so much better than Nick Nolte throughout the whole movie. Yeah, but and he you, still makes so me uncomfortable you, at times. But you think that that's the that's the movie like somehow like prevailing over racism because it elevates Murphy. And I, I guess I, I'm just comparing it to Shawshank Redemption, which I think does a shit job in modern movies, which would have to stop and look at the camera and be like, "Isn't a lesson to be learned?" <laughs> so wait, ho- hold on. Uh, who cares about Forty Eight Hours? Mike, you watched it this week? Yes. And these movies... Was I right? Oh, yeah. Well, I already knew I didn't like it, but I haven't seen it since, like, high school. And, yeah, now I have very specific, pointed arguments about why it sucks. The only reason to watch it. <laughs> I, I also love Morgan Freeman's dulcet tones, but if your movie is an hour and 48 minutes and he's talking for an hour and 28 minutes, it's not a good movie. Uh, the thing, like, I think that the movie all comes down to not just Nick Nolte apologizing, in which he said... I'm sorry, but uh, it's <laughs> Eddie Murphy's line after that where he's like, man, not all of that was the job. Yeah. Not yeah. all of you being racist was the job. And then he laughs and he doesn't Eddie Murphy oh, laugh. Oh, oh. Um, but that I, I do think that a lot of Eddie Murphy's grossness is comes off as more of a I'm, I'm trying to create a persona that does not work, mm. that like he is constantly, you know, uh, given the cold shoulder by almost all the women in this movie. Whereas Nick Nolte is trying to claim that he has a racist persona in order to keep the man or keep Eddie Murphy down. But <laughs> Eddie Murphy's like, nah, that's not true. I mean, we're, we'll still be friends, but that's not fucking true. <laughs> and in a movie like about race, it, like that's one major conversation you could have about it. The misogyny of the movie is on par like oh, with, yeah. that I don't think we have seen in another one of these Non-stop. movies. Like how that's many times... Story. How many times, like, are women just used as human shields that Literal. neither the good guys or the bad guys like stop firing at? Like, <laughs> and like the like the women in this movie are handled so roughly mm-hmm. by the by the actors, literally like handled and pushed around, and I think oftentimes shocked by the way that they're being physically handled. I mean, you can see like real shock on their faces sometimes when like there's a part where Nick Nolte grabs um, the the brunette with short hair around yeah. the throat. And you can tell that the actress is like, oh, my God, what's he doing? And I just like. Almost like one of those things where like that wasn't even in the script. That just he Nick just Nolte decided just to do it. To Nick Nolte. Yeah, exactly. And so like that's that, that's another major component behind the, the racism is that like I just felt like this movie portrayed women as Work. disposable yeah. and as not quite fully human. And maybe it's because of like events going on in the media at the same time. But like this coming watching this movie with the backdrop of the roe v wade decision it really did just feel like this movie is about like fuck you women and nick nolte turns away from his own relationship to like build what feels like ultimately a closer relationship Mm -hmm. with eddie murphy and like yeah they have more emotional connectedness and it's because he kind of turns from that world it just it's so icky all of it was icky i think that's all over the movie. I mean, like from the start, James Ramar, the villain, gets finally laid, and then just pouts. And the uh, the woman of the night that he hired, the sex worker that he hired, is in the police station saying, uh, "Yeah, I don't know. I think he wanted to shoot out with the police much more than he wanted to have sex." Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that ultimately the world of men and the interactions of men are what is like paramount. Now you could say the movie turns from that with this weird thing at the end where um i keep calling him eddie murphy but i realize that that reggie. is not that reggie, reggie. Hammond. where who, reggie named who, because uh eddie murphy his original name was like willie black or something and and yeah eddie murphy was like <laughs> that is a stereotypical black person's name uh it's could reggie we do better than that how about reggie that's, for reggie jackson that, that's a name that i feel like a white writer made up to name a black character mm. <laughs> i hope that's not represented anywhere else in this movie but the he has spent the entire movie saying he wants trim. pussy and trim, but the only way in which the movie, t- I feel like, does turn away from its misogynistic bent is he's <laughs> weirdly kind of sweet and gentlemanly after he has sex with the woman from the with bar. Candy? Yeah. Yeah, he's like... Brr. And that was, like, probably my 
favorite moment of the movie was he's just like, all right, I'm going to be back in six months. Give you a little money. Take care of yourself. Which, uh, that's always a little weird. But well, and she's even like, take- I'm not a pro. And he's like, no, 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 just to take care of you. But <laughs> it, yeah, it is, it's especially like his hit pickup line is like, I need trim. I'm going to bust. And she, her reaction kind of is like, <laughs> how sweet. It's a little <laughs> off, but it's how sweet. That's the thing what? that I think ruins Reggie or like the whole thing that he's the whole journey that he's on is that girl at the end, like sort of falling yes. for it because the first 80 percent of the movie, he goes up and he just starts talking to girls who are clearly talking to other dudes. Yes. And then he like can't believe or, that the Reggie of it all <laughs> didn't like get him, get them. Right or in are in jail and being booked for being prostitutes. And he's like, I'm a lawyer. You want to just go in that room and fuck <laughs> like. Not the other thing too is uh, going back to race is I wanted to point out Nolte's handling of Reggie outside of calling him convict with the hard T, calling him watermelon, yes. calling him other things is, um, hey man, I just need dinner. He says, I just need dinner, and then Nick Nolte takes him to a vending machine and gives him a candy bar. And I know this is a bully being a dick to a somebody he can bully but also i think that this is bigger than that i really think that like yeah you're equal and i will let you know how equal you are whenever i choose and to he that uh in that scene he also nick nolte is like so rough with eddie murphy with his hands like that's really two dudes interacting and i swear you can see in eddie murphy he's like dude you're hurting me like it's not it's not worth you treating me this way just because we're like doing a performance like you're grabbing my handcuffed hands and like pulling down on my shoulders really hard and it just feels so it feels like what is supposed to be in there is a lot of racial animus that doesn't always quite come to the surface and what's said mm-hmm. a lot of times the racism is like almost lazy in this movie like the, w- when he like invokes watermelon it's not like to say like hey the stereotype is that you folks like watermelon. He just says watermelon. Well, isn't yeah. that showing like, how fucking lazy racists yeah. are? Like, <laughs> he can't even bother to form in, it into a sentence. In Torchies, the cowboy watermelon. bar, the guy's just like, when Eddie Murphy first walks up to the bar, and he goes, what do you want? Let me guess. A black Russian? And Eddie Murphy's reaction was perfect there. <laughs> uh, a bartender who is not played by Meatloaf, by the way. No? Yeah, that's not Meatloaf. That's not that's Meatloaf That's his name in the somehow. credits. Not Meatloaf. <laughs> Which is my favorite dinner. Uh, we're going to take a break. Wonderful job, gentlemen. But unfortunately, we are going to go away from 48 Hours and the movies for a second and talk about television. Mount Rushmore. That's right. It's Rushmore time. Rushmore is a mountain with four heads of presidents, but we're going to make it four heads of television. Now, not like Max Headroom, not like somebody with a TV head. From Saga. You mean like executives, like the head honchos, head That's of television departments? The Jonathan Bornathan, the guy who ran ABC in 1982. That's uh, Moonvez. Steve Stevenson, the guy who ran NBC. Not those people. When you think 1982 TV, which I know the two of you do always. All the time. Every chance who, I get. Who are the four heads that belong on this mountain? Because I'm host, I, as always, have something secret in my head. If you say it, you get a ton of points. Woo! Mike, you're up first. Who needs I to be on this mountain? Posit the, the the face of the mountain is clearly Hawkeye, and you're like, what? That came out last year. Jeremy Renner wasn't even alive in 2020, in 1982, probably. No, I mean Alan Alda. Mash is was it in true its that second this to last show season. Is about somebody crushing. who choked a chicken. He did choke the chicken, and it's sadder than you think it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. But last season. It's the second to last season, and it was still reigning supreme, still longer than the Korean War. Uh, and is holds up to all the all the fanfare you've heard through the years. Mash fucking rules, man. So you, not you, only did it own, it's great. You have mashed, Mike. I've mashed. I've done the monster mash, and you enjoyed it. It you you can attest that it holds up. Yeah, I went through a phase where I, I watched the movie and then watched a fuck ton of the show. The I like the show infinitely more than I like the movie. Do you guys find that uh, when you do mash, you always get Shaq? Even though that sweet mansion apartment and house is right there? It's right yes. there, but you just can't quite get it. But that's the paper tells the truth. We will all live in shacks. Yeah, our generation. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Um, Bill Hader has an incredible Alan Alda impression. <laughs> yes, he does. But, Mike, I've heard that yours is better. Well, we're in the war, hot lips. Okay. 
J- Jack Nicholson from <laughs> Chinatown. Thank you for that. Gre- uh, that's on the baby pile. Greg? I, when I think TV, when I think comedy, I think of this show, which taught us that making your way in the world today, it can take everything you've got. And going somewhere where everyone knows your name sure would help a lot. Cheers. Sam Malone, the whole gang. I watched this recently with my wife. Cheers was on for quite a long time there are many many episodes of cheers 271 uh, and Shit, that's a lot. they are almost all of them very good uh it's such a fun experience norm cliff clavin sam malone coach when he was still alive uh all your favorites and when craig t nelson died like that that was crazy uh <laughs> now this was the first season of cheers which nobody watched wasn't it that? Oh yeah, it is the first season. Yeah, just just the first season of the best comedy of all time. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go. And do you want uh, Sam Mayday Malone to be on there? Oh yeah, of course. Coming into our household and into our hearts forever. I'm gonna put the- that one on the maybe pile as well. <sighs> wow. And now it's on, Mike. What do you got? Do you know what's super fucking eighty two and has never been seen as handsome since then? Mustaches. Magnum P.I., that fucking thick-ass much ass made everybody wet. And that's why I want just the mustache and his Hawaiian shirt and that sweet Ferrari. What's what's so crazy about Mike is that um, he's so vulgar, and yet he's reading from a script. Like, he wrote <laughs> that beforehand and then still talks about vaginas yeah. in that way. This mountain's going to make people wet. All the trim. Mike. <laughs> Mike, Magnum P.I. is on the list. Wow. Oh, yeah. Mash and cheers. Push to the maybe pile, making way for Magnum P.I. Do you want Mike to get another point? <laughs> yes. No. Okay. Greg, what do you got? <laughs> no, I can't even do it. Should have practiced my Eddie Murphy laugh better. And we all know Magnum P.I. from Friends, right? Yes. He married Monica? Richard. Richard married Monica. Okay. He didn't marry her. Growing uh, up sorry. as young gentlemen, we had a show that taught us all about high school um, called Beverly Hills 90210. Dunna, 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 dunna. <laughs> um, and we would not have had that show if not for another, perhaps the first great primetime soap opera, Dynasty. And we certainly would not have one of the greatest episodes of The Simpsons ever. The scintillating Work. mystery, Who Shot Mr. Burns? And I won't Work. tell you who it is, folks, but go so- buy some Butterfingers because the answer might be inside one of the rappers. You just never know. Uh, we wouldn't have shows like that if not for Dynasty, a show that sounds uh, very interesting, sounds like appointment viewing for 1982, and I think like the people were kind of like deeply caught up in the goings on of this family. Point- when I, sorry, Mike, when go you, ahead. I was gonna say point of order. Dynasty was a big deal at this time, and the Who Shot Mr. Burns was a big deal related to a dr- soap opera of this time. Dallas, Jer was in Dallas. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. That's true. That's a I'll, completely different show. Greg, I'll give Mike. you guys both a point for that one. <laughs> but is it J.R. Ewing? Yes. The Ewings are Dallas. Yeah. It's a, di- it's a totally different show, guys. But Dynasty, Ryan. Uh, Dynasty about, was a big deal. Yeah. It was a big. It was on when you research. I would go so far as to say this. When you research 1982 shows... Dynasty is one of the names that will definitely <laughs> come up. Like, probably one of the names that you recognize. I didn't even research because I just went through my uh, brain of all the just 82 TV. The I, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I've watched. And um, Dynasty, Dallas, Falcon's Crest, Knott's Landing. The soaps have entered primetime in this year, gentlemen. This and they are a- taking the over. Era of Aaron Sorkin. Era and Sorkin. Aaron Spelling. Wait. Yes, yeah, you're wrong you. too. Sometimes, <laughs> Mike, you think you're so smart, but and actually, that's the dynasty of you're the show. Dumb, just like me. <laughs> We're this all is dumb Greg here. signing out. <laughs> no, uh, I'll keep doing the podcast. <laughs> the most important thing to do on this show is not research, not even watch the movie. <laughs> it's to understand who the host is, and if you're going to bring up Beverly Hills 90210 and The Simpsons in your pit for yeah. Rushmore, then you're going to get the fucking point. You're going to be on the mountain. So the we, dynasty is on the mountain. D- d- J.R. Ewing from Dallas is on the mountain. Mike, back Woo. to you. <laughs> okay, well, I was going to say Dallas, because Greg said, I'm very confused as to what happened. Try uh, to say Dynasty. I mean, it was a big deal, but now I feel like I look like a fucking idiot. I'm not going to 
do that. Uh, two people is great, but three is company. And this was riding high. It was a new cast, but Jack Ritter was still there in Shanks. This is the era of uh, Jack's Bistro. Uh, oh, wow. And he would, you now and now, uh, the, the guy he used to try to find out if he was gay or not is now his friend and he defends him. Mr. But the Furley? hijinks, Mr. Furley, they're buddies now. The Does hijinks he drop are hog still, in this one? He drops full hog. <laughs> <laughs> For a sitcom to do that. <laughs> but isn't that, classically, didn't John Ritter show, was it was it dick or just balls? Perhaps balls. I think he like- A uh, ball. Dangled balls. Part of like, the shaft. Wearing short shorts. He threw one leg up. On the couch to have a meaningful moment. I think the episode was rated TVMA for one ball. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, and, I think that this person is an all-time comedy classic up oh, there yeah. with Chaplin and Buster Keaton. I'm putting John Ritter, who played Jack Tripper, yeah, on the list. Yep. On the ma- He's on the mountain. Wow. Mike. Can it be him and one of his balls? Just the sack, just just the sack coming out of some shorts. Actually, what I'm going to put is Mr. Belvedere sitting on one of John yeah. Ritter's balls. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg, you're up. We have three on and th- two maybes. All right. Um, 1982 asks us to imagine something so horrible. Uh, what if your kid was a Republican? Um, and I feel like there's a lot of parents now who this is happening to them. So maybe they could reboot this show, Family Ties, because I don't think it'd be so cute anymore. Because instead of like wearing a little suit and talking about Reaganomics, he'd like have a little tiki torch and be saying, "You will not replace us." Uh, but Family Ties, Alex P. Keaton, the uh, sort of yuppie son of his hippie parents uh, who believed in in free market and. Milton Friedman and all that good stuff. What a twist. What a twist. Yeah. The kid He's young. Is, yeah. But he like believes in the things that usually only cynical older people. Now, it, did it turn out that those beliefs uh, bankrupted and destroyed society? Yes. Obviously, Alex P. Keaton was wrong. Uh, he backed a losing bid and so did America. But I still think there, he had a strong message at the time. You turn a laugh track on. It's hilarious. Yeah. It doesn't matter that it ruined a country. But did they know at the time that like that is the joke is this young kid is the asshole? Oh yeah. yeah. The parents are supposed to be cool. Yeah, that was the whole thing. The parents would like look at each other and just be like, ah, making your way in the world today takes everything you got. And he, <laughs> I, he was the first like um <laughs> I, I there's a lot of people that like tweet and do social media about how like, oh, really did Biden win? How come I don't see Biden hats everywhere? Right. You know, like and he was the first like Reagan was his god. Like he, yeah. he was the first to treat a uh, president. Like I'm also uh, like the biggest fan of the sports team. APK is on the maybe pile. Speed round. Got to go fast, Mike. Here we go. Spider Man and his amazing friends. Oh boy, was in okay. his second season. <laughs> Greg, Knight Rider. The car talked. <laughs> Mike, TJ Hooker started. That guy is cool. <laughs> Greg. SCTV has, like, all of our favorites. It's the Saturday Night Live that no one's heard of. Oh, boy. Mike? The Jeffersons, we're still on. All right. That's time. So, Magna P.I., J.R. Ewing, and John Ritter are on. Or maybe these include Alan Alda, Sam Malone, APK, Spider-Man, the cast of SCTV, Kit, which is a car. <laughs> that talks. That oh, car that talks. It's Mr. Feeney's voice. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm going to go with Spider-Man. So, Mike, <laughs> yeah. you get the point. Play to your host. Play to your host. Your Rushmore of 1982 TV is Magna P.I., J.R. Ewing, John Ritter, Spider-Man, Firestar, and Iceman, <laughs> who were apparently roommates in 1982. That's your TV Rushmore. When we come back, more 48 hours. <laughs> well, that is very, very funny. Or very sad, and perhaps now you have something to think about. Or very problematic, and perhaps we have something to think about. But in any event, I'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to. So why not check us out on the social media? You can go to Instagram or Twitter and find us at Your Pop Filter. Email contacts at Your Pop Filter. Hey, everybody. Keep watching them movies. All right, gentlemen, let's get to the Nolte and Murphy of it all, and we have to start with Murphy. Was it clear, watching this, 
that he was about to be a superstar. If you if you showed somebody who was like fifteen this movie, are they like that? That's a superstar in the making. Yeah, if you show, I think if you showed them the second half of the movie, no, I like from his fucking opening, man. He, we the we, first scene. <laughs> We meet him, we hear him before we meet him, and just right there, I'm like, I want to know more about this guy. Was that different than the walk for uh, Clarice Starling down that <laughs> row of cells? I, felt I would like love if Sperm Thrower was singing Roxanne. Migs. I felt like he got <laughs> so much more comfortable. I don't know if they shot this sequentially or whatever, but the, he gets so much more comfortable towards the end of the movie. In the beginning, he was talking so fast. And it feels like the beginning of the movie, they're like, we don't have much time to establish everything, so everybody talk double speed. Uh, but like, towards the middle and the end, he seems to get really, really comfortable. I think you could definitely see the glimmers of it, that you know there was something there. Yeah, I think he's electric. He, right. This is his first movie. He's fucking 20. But he, the way he delivers lines, I do think other people would be even cheesier. The, I've been in prison for three years. My dick gets hard when the wind blows. Or uh, you said bullshit experience, right? follow me and experience some of my bullshit like Mike. And his, and, and, he does tongue twisters throughout the movie <laughs> another one which yeah like that is hard especially if you're reading them which apparently a lot Mike. more of this movie than you would think was scripted like mm-hmm. it's not him going off as much as you would think but there's another one towards the end uh which seems like such a fucking uh, corny joke but it's he's going to sleep in the back and he's like uh tell me a story like yeah that only works through clear murphy magic right and I I do feel like that's like in the category of dad jokes though, kind of like easygoing jokes that mm. aren't super funny, aren't super clever, but are it just in there to make people feel comfortable because they can recognize them as jokes. Is it more of a joke or more of a dad joke than Nolte getting the uh, like visibly getting the idea to slam the car <laughs> on him yeah. while he's sleeving the car door? No, and Nolte's then this, all of her dads. This face of like I'm gonna do it. Yo, I <laughs> slam the car door on you when you were sleeping. I, I think the the scene where Murphy owns the redneck bar, he fully owns the movie at that point. Let's just and get we're to that. All like that's that. that's the scene. So yeah, like why did that work so well? Because like he should be an asshole. Like he is throwing glasses against the walls and stuff. But he, I think that the reason why the he's not comfortable yet works is that I don't think Reggie is comfortable yet, and that's where Reggie's like, oh, I think I'm allowed to do whatever I want. And he fully owns that. He knows Mike. he's doing a one-man improv scene and forcing other people to do it with him. They don't realize it. Like, And he's constantly trying to, like, huh, did you catch that I got a gun? Like, He doesn't care that Nolte saw him. He's just like always trying to do a little magic show for his partner. Uh, he's playing to Nolte that whole scene, not to the crowd, and it's hilarious. And Again, I really going back to the last segment, <laughs> uh, not to the women. Like. It's no. not to the women. It's to Nolte. I, I need you to be impressed with Nolte. Hey, Nolte, did you have sex with your girlfriend, your long-term relationship last night? Yes, I did. Tell me about it. Like, it's just me and you in this room. That's what it, the whole movie is. The mm. funny part is he's like, was it nice? And Nick Nolte's like, yeah, it was nice. <laughs> ah, but then we got in a big fight the next morning. <laughs> but like also, the, before, he's like, I'm not giving you details. And then just, just keeps talking about it. She says I'm emotionally unavailable. <laughs> Uh, that scene is like it's so fraught with tension um, as artificial a construct as it is which is that you step into the deep south in the middle of San Francisco knowing that like the stakes are so high mm-hmm. and that the just like the inherent violence in a black man in that bar I think charges it with a lot and then he steps up to the moment and delivers it you know really effectively and he does it in his very easygoing way. That's the thing, like, Eddie Murphy doesn't try right. in this movie to make any of these half jokes right. into full jokes. Mm-mm. He just, like, he really su- he supplies charm rather than, like, humor in a lot of places, and that actually makes the jokes funnier but the a o- lot of times. The other thing, too, though, right. is that you can see him take a deep breath after all of these you could see reggie being like oh my yes. god i can't believe that worked and especially walking out of that bar yeah, yeah he like his last couple steps are pretty quick that's what happened to eddie murphy though is that i'm just gonna play reggie hammond when he's at 11 and i'm never gonna show you that that's an act for the character i'm playing right. i'm just gonna be yeah. this character who is always like that and that's when we lost him the 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 and this goes for beverly hills cop too a not funny movie like, it, there's not a lot of jokes in that movie either. 
it's just an action movie with Eddie Murphy. Of just, just like, charming as hell. Yeah, I just got, uh, here we go. And then, like, he plays it up, and then he's like, oh, my God, I'm not stabbed. Fuck, <laughs> thank, thank God I'm not stabbed. Is that the key to his career, that the, hit, the joke's not very complex, but you like the guy so much that you're just, like, pleased I think, to watch him do anything? I mean, how many black action stars in white movies did we have before this movie came out? Uh, it's got to be close to zero. And then now he's getting you to root for him over a bar full of good old boys. That's an accomplishment. That is something that like he is doing through sh- sheer star power, and I know, like we talked about, like it was all scripted, but still, that's that's because of that thousand watt smile, you know. Yeah, I think that makes it more impressive, to be honest. Like it, it's in a way, it's easy to just like it's easier to just off the top of your head say whatever, but to take lines that might be kind of like limpid prose mm-hmm. and be like, you know what, I know how to punch this up without changing it. That's like, I mean, that's acting, right? That's like a, right. that's a, a lot goes into that. All right, there's the other side of this. For every yin, yin there's a yang. Uh, Nick Nolte was the first star signed as a Nick Nolte vehicle. His performance, what do we think? I One, I'm shocked there's not a dozen Murphy Nolte movies after this, that there's just the one more. I would, I would watch them together all the time. I don't know if I would watch Nolte a thousand times. Just uh, Nolte? But... I, One man play, simply Nolte. Yeah, just Nolte, naughty Nolte, uh, not but Nolte. <laughs> <laughs> he, I think he, a, a lesser. We talked about a promising young woman. What two years ago? Yes. Uh, and our issue with Christopher Mintz Plas was he wanted to play his character so big that we knew Christopher Mintz Plas wasn't a creep rapist. Yeah, the character was. Nick Nolte has none of that in him. He inhabits like a dirty used suit jacket, Jack. Uh, Dude, I agree with that whole. And like so many times, Greg, you're like, and it's just Nolte doing that to real actors. I'm like, is he or is he? He gets Jack, and Jack is a piece of shit. But he before like we, I'm sorry. Shit. Before we get to Nolte, can we say that like, uh, without looking at the list, is this the most star making performance we've ever done on Movie of the Year? Is the N word with the badge? Is coming hot as like a 20 year old? Is this the most star making p- performance we can think of? Knowing that he was 20 has really changed my That's perspective so fucking on crazy. a lot of this. Like, it's taken what was, like, a really good performance. And, it was like, I hated the movie, but I think his performance, especially in parts, is definitely a bright spot. To think of him as being 20, that is, like, it's kind of mind-boggling. I definitely don't think the character is supposed to be 20. Because he's, like, supposed to have already been in prison for two and a half years. Yeah. And but the like, way, yeah, the way he interacts with the world is not how a 17-year-old going on 20 Mike. interacts Mike. but like a blockbuster movie that like outperformed all its expectations yeah yeah i think it is a, as much of a star making movie as basically yeah, as we've ever had so there is another person mike you were talking about him and then i rudely interrupted you i apologize classic but, ryan um the the first cast was nick nolte does does he know the movie more than anybody else in the movie i i really think so and i think he's like an actor's actor where he he d- does not care at all what people might think Nick Nolte is like he put he becomes this character Mike yeah I, I have I, heard it called brave I've heard his performance called brave because even at this time to he's disgusting to cut to call <laughs> uh, a black person watermelon is putting your career in jeopardy yeah I could I, see that and he's just gonna fucking do it brave it, it seems like a stretch but I will say it is kind of commendable not to feel like an actor is trying to insulate himself from how distasteful right. the character that he's portraying is. And like, I think that the character doesn't arc as much as would be satisfying, but perhaps that's something that's realistic about the movie that he only grows so much. He can't grow in every single direction. It's shocking. He does grow <laughs> like that's true. And I, I think for a while I thought the Annette O'Toole character, his right. girlfriend existed to sh- give him humanity, but it only gives you more excuses and yeah. more reasons to hate him. It yeah, doesn't. Basically. I'm not like now. I get to know him, and l- I like him. It's no. This guy sucks. He even can, more. And he can't stop. He can't. He will always say. He should just say to his girlfriend Annette O'Toole, "You will always be my last priority." I swear yes. to God, if somebody, if you, I'm on the phone with you and somebody brings in donuts, I will put the phone down and let you keep talking to get one of those goddamn donuts. What if he had God just been donuts. a little honest with her? What if he had just said? I have this work that I have to do over this discrete period, 48 hours. If I he have had, 48 his hours. His explanation, to... like, I just need a couple nights here. You know right. I'm a cop. 
I'm doing that standard thing where you take out a prisoner and he belongs to you for <laughs> two days, but then you have you know to give him works. back. <laughs> it's one of those. It's a f- well. From now on, we'll call it a 48 hour situation. Although right now we probably don't have a good name for it. <laughs> but if he had just said that to her, I think she would have been like, okay. But instead, he's yeah. just like, he's. He, I'll be there. He won't open up to her at all, and that is no. what reminds us that he has opened his heart up to a different type of man. It will yeah, never it, be a woman, but he will ha- open up his compassion to a different type of man even than he has before. Even a woman who is crazy understanding, she gives him a lot of leeway, even though she calls him out, and is so far out of his league. Way, way out of his hot. league. I so know far- an editor from Smallville when she is uh, Martha. She is Clark's mom, and she's like, you know, an attractive little lady. I didn't know she used to be a fucking smoke show. I'm sorry. Is this the period where we get gross, or is this not Patreon? No, not in this one. <laughs> um, I do, I'm not going to argue with you, Greg, that this movie is not misogynistic. I'm not going to say that. But I do think that the movie is smarter than, in it, that it, smarter than it appears at almost all times, and I do think that it does a good job of saying, if these fucking morons would talk to the people mm. that they're around, their life would be easier, but they can't because they're men, and that's stupid. Can I ask you if, if you think it's this smart? Because this is kind of an off-the-wall thing. Do you think that the movie evolves in how it lights Eddie Murphy, and it lights him more classically in a terrible Hollywood light early on so that like he is hard to distinguish? And then in the end, with the neon purples and blues and pinks of Chinatown, Whoa. that they're actually literally Work. trying to render him better than they do in the beginning of the movie? I got to say, I'm going to give Greg that point and not 48 hours because Greg noticed that. And there's no way the fucking movie did. No, that was <laughs> okay, accidental. So no, we're not going that far. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, that's the, my the, assumption. The set decorator went, Chinatown's got a lot of purple neon lights. And then Greg's like, ooh, do you know that plays off black skin a lot better? We've learned that in recent years. In, I mean, Insecure taught me that, right? Like, yes, I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah insecure. insecure. <laughs> but so then I was only able to notice it because of that. But I was like, or is this something they're doing? And I think... With 48 Hours, so often, that's the question you're asking yourself. Like, mm-hmm. is this movie just gross and almost pornographic in how awful it's being? Or is it actually kind of making a comment on all of this stuff? And yeah, it, at times, it's almost it a parody, right? Isn't it almost? like it's it, a, The it's, hardest part about this movie is we don't know and we'll never know how much it's trope creating and trope playing. Yeah. Right. You know? like, And I think it's doing both, but we just we could, we could guess and get it totally wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm prepared to do that. <laughs> I'm a middle-aged white man. I'll guess and get it totally wrong all day. All day. <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys the same question I did about Murphy. If uh, you said Nick Nolte to, like your, let's say, your 15-year-old niece or nephew was also a star, would they be like, yeah, I get that? No, they'd be baffled. They'd be like, on the YouTube? There, is it's, this a he TikTok? Is a black hole of charm in this movie, and that's kind of why I respect that and like it and want to yeah. see him in more. Because that is a choice, to be a black hole of charm. I will there, suck the charm of yes. Eddie Murphy away. And it... Man, the, the, the one, one of my favorite Nolte movies where it, it feels like Nolte is sick of being in a buddy cop movie at this point and just shoots Remar, the exhausted like weight of the world, like he's not a hero. And it feels like at that point, Jack realizes he is not a hero and will never be here. He's just got to shut this fucking case down. He looks like a serial killer in that yes. part. He really, like, he flips over to just, like, murderous white person mode, mm-hmm. and he is very scary. And I feel like, like the screenwriters are there. The audience is there. We're all like, you know what? Just stop with the clever. Just fucking kill the guy. <laughs> and, like, the whole uh, I can kill the, the person holding the hostage is right. as much of a trope as... Oh, I got shot in the Bible in my coat pocket, and I survived. <laughs> what's funny about that trope is that he tries throughout the movie, and throughout the movie, people are like, yeah. don't fucking try to do this. <laughs> That's a dumb thing to do. It's <laughs> so totally dangerous. It's and he's finally like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> is it's five uh, shadowing. Is the bad guy in this movie problematically sexy? Oh, he is. I, I didn't know James Remar was a fucking sex pop, man. This guy, like, man, his arms are really defined. He's wearing, like, this knit little sweater, sweater vest at one point. Beard, uh, the only man. way it could Glacial be sexier if, eyes. if he was laying in bed knitting that sweater while he was mm. wearing it. Like, mm. I'm just going to finish this sweater up real quick. I and wish he was my ghost boy. dad and taught me how to murder. <laughs> <laughs> He's Dexter's dad, for those then, of you who watch Dexter. T- is you, are you guys to... Uh, is he to you more Dexter's dad or Black Lightning's weapon person? Gamby? Gamby. <laughs> He's always Gamby in my He'll heart. He'll be Gamby for me, yeah. <laughs> and then doesn't he become Gumbo, Blur. Gamby's brother or something? <laughs> <laughs> the spicy Cajun twin brother. 
Raw. <laughs> uh, all right. Once we once we start talking about James Remar and his parts, then uh, that means that we're done. We're gonna take a break, and when we come back, we are going to discuss the rest of the season. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to Pop Filter. Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie, everything is there at yourpopfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark. And do your shopping from there. That way, we get a little piece of the action, and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That Superhero Show Show, that's movie of the year and that's yourpopfilter.com rate subscribe review bye gentlemen we are back we had a uh international vote about what bonus episodes we are going to do for the 1982 season um it all came down to five we're gonna put four into the season and then one is going to be a classic watch along like we love to do so classic Classic one. Everybody voted except for uh, Taylor and Jordan, who are woefully misrepresented in what we're about to do. Um, The first one is a two and a half hour movie from my favorite subgenre. It's Das Boot. Das Boot. Yeah, this feels like one of like a biggie, right? I want to get in on this movie. This one I'm very, I really hope wins. The whole time we do this segment, I'm thinking, Greg, every movie I say, Greg's going to be like, in 48 hours made it? This is <laughs> yeah. what the fuck happened. <laughs> yeah. I do think that 48 hours is way more 1982, but I don't Dust know. Boot is too timeless. I mean, it's Gene Hackman, Denzel Washington. Mm-hmm. One has the nuclear sub. Yeah. All sub fight. movies are the same to me. I can't fucking. Kelsey Grammer's there. The periscope's going down. It's always uh, like someone's got it, takes a nuclear sub, and they go like wherever they want to instead of where they're supposed to go, right? And then you're like, ah, man. Andre Brower, before he was on Brooklyn Nine Nine, I watched a little one season show called The Last Resort that was all about that, and I fucking loved it. Anytime you have a bad show, you get Andre Brower, Dude, and now it's two out. times now it's better. The best show. So uh, Das Boot eligible for Moody's. We'll see if any of those uh, semen get awards. The next one is Ron Howard's Night Shift with Michael Keaton and <laughs> That's uh, pretty surprising. Henry Winkler. Running a brothel out of a morgue. Wait, are these fighting, or the, you're telling us these are making? This it? is what won. This is what we're doing. Holy crap! Night shift made it up there. Well, you know, it. This comes from a time where, if like running a brothel out of something, that was like a genre of mm-hmm. movie. <laughs> I feel like we haven't had that in a while, and that uh, feels very. 82. And we should bring it back. Death yeah, of the seventies, maybe. Dude, is there ever been a better time to like check in on the the work of Henry Winks? I mean, he might be a pop filter Hall of Famer by the time this season's over. Uh, nepotism, much though. Ron Howard directs a movie, mm-hmm. so uh, what's his name? Richie Howard, and then he gets the Fonz Richie to star Cunningham. in it. Richie Cunningham. <laughs> so Ron Howard didn't play Richie Howard on the show Happy <laughs> Howard. Did not play Richie Howard on the Happy Howards. And everybody remembers Michael Keaton's star making turn as Mork, the evil alien. Oh, I love that. <laughs> The next one is Sidney Lumet's The Verdict, something that I pulled very hard for. I tried to get this in the Elite Eight. I do think that when we watch it, we'll be like, well, we fucked up. We this blew is it. P- Paul Newman as a lawyer that isn't great at his job or morality going through life. And uh, please remember that I mentioned that Bruce Willis is in the very back row of the right. uh, courtroom in the last scene. We will remember that. I'm I excited. It. It's going to be a good one. Yeah. I like trial shit now. I'm old. And you never think of that, like uh, it's not a podcast though, Mike. It's just a movie. If ever, if people imagine themselves being a lawyer, they're always like, and then I would be like, the case. I rest my case, Your Honor, and then everyone get up and clap. No one's ever like, what if you're the person who, because he does such a bad job, <laughs> yeah. somebody goes Someone's to goes jail. Away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because I'm gonna go that's drink a bunch. Of, that's one of the only lines I know from courtrooms. So I would say that immediately. Like, yeah, just like the, a you stand up. If the judge was like, uh, Ryan, begin your case. That's what I would say. Uh, <laughs> the next one is our Tootsie Go Along. It's Victor Victoria is right. in the bonus round. 
Yeah, this is going to make such a great companion piece. Yeah, I like that a lot. Man, we're going to have such thoughtful conversations about that movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, this one that you're having right now about this movie, the, the meta conversation you're doing is also amazing. Our watch along, guys, this is for Patreon only, so sign up now. It's Piranha 2 The Spawning, James Cameron's first movie. <laughs> that <laughs> tracks. First that of all, feels it's, it's perfect 96 for Patreon. minutes instead of two and a half hours, like the film Hook. That's smart. That's it. really oh, smart. I like Good job, that. James. It's already better than Hook. I do believe the piranhas are like kind of in the in the like the sewer system or something in this, and so that really opens you up to a lot of the different places piranhas could be. Yeah. Opens your butt in your pool, your in your bathtub. You know, they shouldn't be in there, but they might be. They shouldn't be in there. Those silly piranhas. <laughs> Basket Case, Butcher Baker, Nightmare Maker, um, Cue the Winged Serpent. uh, Season of the Witch. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, Slumber Party Massacre, all the movies that we talked about with Taylor and Jordan. Um, Grease 2 was was so far from making it, it's laughable that you would even bring it up in this segment. Um, (laughs) They did not make it, but maybe that's for a different season, I guess. Mike, are you bummed with these four movies? Uh, It's fucking horseshit that not one horror movie is in there, yes. I think... I think many of these movies are better than <laughs> the bracket movies. I don't know if they're like better movie of the year material, but they are certainly among the best movies we'll be watching, including Piranha 2. And yeah, I think that, Mike, we did our best to get those horror movies elevated, uh, mm-hmm. but Greg has a third of the vote. So yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's yeah, not much we can bullshit do. that he still counts. <laughs> if uh, I genuinely hate most of those movies and so i'm already gonna be watching poltergeist and the thing like if they're good movies i'm willing to give it a shot but if it's like slumber party massacre nah nah that feels like prejudice yeah Um, slumber parties it's just what i like and don't like it's not prejudice that's That's uh, prejudice (laughs) (laughs) that's all right those are our bonus shows for the year uh so watch out for those make sure you're subscribed so you get them all when we come back one more question about 48 hours We're almost out of time with 48 Hours. I wanted to bring one more thing up. I want to talk genre, but the first genre I want to talk about, if this counts, is cop movie. This is long before the ACAB acronym was made. This is the time where uh, cops were like taught in schools as like somebody you can go to for help instead of mm-hmm. to be more pestered than you already were. How do we feel this movie handles cops? ACAB. I think it's ahead of its time. Like Even, even Mike Ehrmantraut... It's kind of a piece of shit. They're <laughs> more worried about their petty interpolice bullshit than they are about solving crimes. All of them. I feel like it comes from a time when Mike. drama didn't understand the actual cop mindset yet. So, like, in the one of the early scenes, two cops get iced during this, like, arrest gone wrong. And nowadays, when that happens in a cop drama, like, a city gets locked down, mm-hmm. like, they go to war, right? Because two of their own... In this one, they're like, I'm frustrated because cops were killed. And so it's yeah. like, that doesn't ring true, though. There's it a little pushing in the police station where they're like, you, yeah. you got a cop killed. No, uh, no, I didn't. And that's no, uh. it. That's sort of like... And then they're the- like, all right, then go handle this on your own, then. You better write like, some paperwork what? then, bud. <laughs> and I th- I'll do that tomorrow. I feel like one thing we noticed in the 91 movies was a lot of cop... T- cop skepticism in Mm. this i feel like there was a lot of like ah they're just like everybody else and so some of them are kind of crooked but most of them are just trying to do their work and there was one particular scene that i think tried to make the cops look hyper professional which is probably like if there's a shot that is as good as the bar scene it's the in the police station, one extremely long shot, all this action going on every single place. And it is such a fanta- like a fantasy scene because everybody's like piled into one room and they're like, I'm going to interview this uh, prostitute over here and I'm going to bring up the lab results over here. Um, and it's some of the only flattering portrayals of women seen in the entire movie. And the cops are kind of shown as this like well-oiled machine that functions very effectively. What are those things like uh, on a perfect moment of Empire Records where everybody like they're employees, but it's almost choreographed. Where yeah. We all know how to move and who to hand the file to. And we slip behind this guy. Yeah. Is- somebody walks off screen right. And then somebody comes right on screen left. You know, the camera moves and sort of like a balletic like function with everybody else. Is that where Eddie Murphy first is there, or w- when is this? This is before. Uh, this is when they're interrogating the prostitutes. This is when she says he was more interested in shooting out with cops. Gotcha, and it, gotcha. it's, it's just a big, long one and it's not flashy. 
it's just they don't cut. They just show the. It's funny because the, they it's give well them, oiled. They give themselves places to cut. People walk in front of the camera where they could do a cut, but it clearly just worked, and so they yeah. didn't have to do that. But it's a it's like probably a ten minute shot or something. Like, nah, it's probably too much. But it's a, it's a big long shot, and you don't feel it in the way that you're like, wow, it's a it's a huge wonder. You feel mm. it in the energy and the enthusiasm. Uh, so, it's just I'm not sure any police station has ever functioned anything like what's depicted in the scene. I guess that scene it shows them doing their jobs, but like anytime we sit and spend time with the cops and they actually talk, they are garbage. The chief sucks at his job. Uh, Mike. The guy instead of helping the Nick Nolte catch the cop killers stands across the office and yells at messages at him and says, "You find it yourself on my desk." <laughs> uh, the Jonathan Banks and his partner. Are, they're all just shitty. They're not really working together when they're first finding James Remar. They're always cheating. Like, yeah. fuck you, Nick Nolte, get out of here. We're going to figure this out ourselves. And then Nick Nolte goes behind the desk and breaks all sorts of, I'm sure, cop laws in order to <laughs> right. uh, get the information that he needs because they don't give a fuck. Yeah. I, I mean, don't know. And it, it's, I don't think it's heroic. I think that this is a little. Right. Uh, like Mike said, like A cab before A cab. But I mean, like. Uh, and, and and I guess you could say that Nick Nolte not taking the money at the end because he's not that kind of guy. It yeah. like sort of implicates all other cops, <laughs> but he is still the our moral center of the movie. I feel like honestly the portrayal of the police is just one of the ways in which the movie doesn't cohere. Because Mike, the fact that you kind of forgot this scene early in the movie, I think in part it's because it feels like it's in a different movie. Before like Eddie Murphy really comes it's, on the it's scene, pre Reggie Hammond, and mm-hmm. even a couple of scenes after that. The movie hasn't really determined what it wants to be yet. This is still in the early part of the movie where it's like everything is just kind of dramatic and gritty and awful. And it hasn't really like turned into the movie it will become mm. in the end. We've talked uh, about how the movie is a comedy question mark Ish. with quotation marks. Um, what about an action movie? Is this staged well? Is, uh, are there scenes that are like, OK, it's a shooting movie. I, honestly, it's, it's, like yeah. it, it has fewer action scenes than it does shooting scenes. Like it loves and, guns and it loves having them go off, like for right. almost no reason I, in scenes. Action, action as a genre is crazy. How long it existed and just sucked. I don't action like didn't get good until the nineties because like they didn't know how to shoot car chases. They did like everything was kind of flat and boring and not that exciting. The coolest action scene is bus v car. And that was still pretty tepid. You know what this, as an action movie, honestly, and in so many other ways, this movie reminds me of the porno that Dirk Diggler like started making on his own. Like it's got the (laughs) same sort of like vibe. It's got the same sort of just like shooting off camera nonstop. The same sort of like roughing up women and like calling them bitches and pussies and like putting them in their place and everything. It reminds me so much of like a real life version of that fake porn movie. Men performing as men. This yeah. is not for women. This is for men. I just want male men drag. to think I'm cool. Yeah, it's male drag. Male for to sure. male drag. Greg, Mike. Um, the other thing that I think this movie does. One of the reasons that it's the most important of, or it is important in, in like the action world, is that this is a handoff. This is a torch thing where pre 1982, everyone was Nick Nolte, and post this, everyone is Eddie Murphy, and he becomes mm-hmm. like Beverly Hills Cop. Like we talked about, isn't that funny? And like Eddie Murphy sort of creates. Bruce Willis, one of yeah, I was gonna say Die Hard. I, I don't think it would exist without Reggie Hammond. One of the screenwriters of this movie it wrote uh, Die Hard, Jeb oh, shit. Stewart, um, and then Bruce Willis gives way to uh, just like I'm not a tough guy, admittedly, but I can crack a joke every once in a while, and this is how we get like Tony Stark, Scott Lang. Like we're still right. seeing this today, and if you were just to do a straight movie about John Kate, Nick Nolte's character. That's not going to work anymore. This is this is really, at the end, Nick Nolte saying, like, all right, Eddie Murphy, you take over from here. I'm too tired. Yeah, that would just be, like, Death Note. Not this Death is not Note. Night Moves. Night Moves. Yeah. Speed round. All right, guys, here we go. How badly do you wish there were a dozen more Murphy and Nolte movies? So fucking badly. I would watch. I, uh, I love this pairing. I mean, oh, I will watch that so There's soon. Another one. It's so bad, Mike. Don't Is it? please don't watch it. Another. They named it another forty eight hours. Did they How say here we be? go again? <laughs> I, I guess I I I would be okay with that. 
<laughs> I'm less enthused. Um, we already right. talked about this. Uh, I love when um, we have a question for speed round, but it's too hard to not talk about. It's James Remar being a sex symbol. I just want to go back to it and talk about it a little bit more. It's he oozes sexuality, even though he is the worst person in a movie filled of only bad people. Is it he, the hair that he has to keep like pulling back up yes, above his head? And he's always sweaty, but not like somehow not greasy, just sex sweaty. Also, his arms and his be, fucking arms. And he's like, he's not the he's not the kind of boy you should go with. I think there's so mm-hmm. much of that. Like he's so pretty, and yet at the same time, he's obviously such bad news. I oh, just he's like, gonna bother mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's almost distracting during the movie because you're like, no, this is the bad guy. But dang, look at him go. Look at that vest. <laughs> look at that weird knit it. sweater vest. <laughs> this question has confused me, this next one, since I was a kid. Uh, I think we talked about this when we did Point Break in the last season. Could Gary Busey have swept in and taken over for Nick Nolte and done the same job or better? Well, he would scream about how many sandwiches. Two. Eddie I Murphy should get him a lot more often. <laughs> Uh, I think Busey brings a lot more fun to it. Yeah. Right. I, I know that we have a big disagreement about uh, how much Nick Nolte is this character. I think if you look at Nick Nolte's later life, there's signs that he is a lot like the guy in this mu- in this movie. Gary Busey probably too, but he could bring a lot more like kind of like a whimsical weirdness to it. And I, I, I think a it would have A cartoon character. Yeah. <laughs> if we did a Rushmore of actors you can smell, these two are like <laughs> on the mountain immediately, right? <laughs> I just think yes. that you always talk about how much he smells, and then I just realized that like this starts off with him waking up in the morning, having like just spent the night with a lady, and then he gets up and does not take a shower. No, Instead, he pours some dirty whiskey shirt. in his coffee, and yeah, just the and, shirt that and then she smokes has a cigarette. In. She says, "Hey, if we do this at your place, you could be in a clean shirt." In his witty repartee, he says, "What makes you think there's clean shirts at my place?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Nick Nolte, you have so many one-liners. Finally, why does Reggie Hammond have so much nice stuff in his cell? Like, we hear Roxanne, mm-hmm. and we don't know what to expect. We, we're hoping to not expect jizz thrown in the face, but when we get there, he's in a recliner wearing sunglasses with a Walkman. Is that because he's I... such a good wheeler and dealer? Like, he's yes. so slick that he's able to make sure that he's, like, got good stuff in his cell. I have to imagine he the prequel. with a pebble, and now he he's traded to a lazy boy. The prequel, 47 Hours, is just him getting all that cool shit in his cell, <laughs> right? Well, I think uh, what we don't know is he does get his BA in accounting, and then he cooked all the warden's books and slowly got a great sell, and has also been slowly digging out a tunnel. Because I, when I first saw it, I was like, wait, is this the movie making a point about, like, man, these prisoners have it so easy. <laughs> They're just in there with their Walkman and in their Lazy Boy chairs. It made me think of how much, like, their, how much political coding in right. the 80s was about how disenfranchised groups have it so like easy. Like welfare queens. That's exactly bachelor. what it made me think of. Yeah, yeah, it made me think of welfare queens. Like, here are the who are supposed to be the lowest, but really they're living it up. And so I wondered if that was their point. But like so many other things in the movie, it's just like it doesn't get explored. You just move on. No, and like it's I th- to me it's the thing that stands out the most. Like, is this a naked gun movie because of what uh-huh. the cell looks like? And I think that it, after you watch it for a little bit, you're just like, that's – that's Reggie. That like that's what he's capable of. Reggie's got a Reggie. Also, Reggie's Nick Nolte grabs the Walkman and then just yells into it as if that's gonna make like his voice travel into Reggie's well, ears. Greg, in the in the early, late seventies, early eighties, Walkman were also clearly uh, microphones, <laughs> so <laughs> that would work. All right, we're gonna take a break, and then we're gonna give this movie some fucking awards. One of my favorite shows of all time that we've ever done is the Thelma and Louise show, where we cracked that movie open like nobody else has done. Um, it was That was the Gina and Susan show. We're going to make this the Nick and Eddie show, and we're <laughs> going to start. The first award is the noltiest moment. Mike, what's the noltiest moment? Uh, when he gravels, I believe it's after they go to the black bar, and he goes, yeah, it's my favorite place. <laughs> it probably isn't. It's, I don't think it is. He deadpans like no other. Greg, Noltiest moment? Uh, right after Mike Ehrmantraut gets shot, Nick Nolte looks deep into the camera, like so deep <laughs> that I like felt myself like perceived. And uh, he goes, call for help now. And then he screws up his eyes in like this weird like cross-eyed look and he looks like jeff daniels when he's on the toilet in dumb and dumber i swear to god he puts on the he throws the weirdest face call the cops now 
And <laughs> it's just like pure Nolte. There's no reason to do it. He's trying to be serious, but it's just a big goof. When you got to go, you got to go. Truly the Jared Leto of uh, our <laughs> generation. Brand. Uh if you're gonna have a Nick Nolte moment, you have to have no idea if that was intentional or scripted or the director called for it. Greg's gonna take that one down. Greg, the Murphyist moment. Yeah, uh, always the question: Do you go for the clever answer or I cannot? It's torchies. It's like let me handle this. Give me the badge, and Nick Nolte stands back and lets him have at it. And Eddie Murphy basically runs the movie for like five minutes in what could have a scene that could have gone disastrously wrong Mm -hmm. um and honestly like at the end of it probably totally wins the viewer over instead and we don't quite know who reggie is before that and we completely understand who he is after that he's almost like a superhero of slick he's like charisma through the roof he can talk himself you know into any situation and that means intimidation sometimes it means charm sometimes uh and all of that is because a 20 year old apparently eddie murphy was so confident and such a good performer that he could handle all that spotlight and all that uncomfortable energy maybe it was the 965 dollars uh suit that made him look like that but like you can see bigger stars at the time like richard Pryor, sort of just launching into a bit that he yeah, wrote totally and you can see uh like lower stars, like people with less talent, just being like, "Oh, I have to own this," mm. and coming out way too strong. And it made this scene the way it works. And again, it's not that laugh out loud funny. It's just it makes Reggie look like a watcher of people, right? And he knows like all of the buttons to push and all of the buttons to not push. Mike, that is going to be hard to beat. Uh, they're in the car and. Jack says one of his dumb, grumbly, pseudo racist lines, and Eddie does his classic, like, oh, 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 yeah. hits his leg, and then stone faces and gets real serious. And I'm like, you're fucking, I believe both of these emotions. You're amazing. Yeah, that is very good. But Greg said the most famous yeah. scene in the movie. So it's hard to argue with that, Mike. He, he got that point. Uh, Mike, it's cringiest moment. And is this a hard one in this movie? It's it's difficult because it's just such a pure movie. It's just so <laughs> what makes you cringe. Uh, there's so many to choose from. I think I have to land on the scene where Nolte and Murphy go through to the women's apartment, and the ladies are just convinced they're faking being cops and are going to be raped, and nothing Murphy or Nolte do after that lets them know that's not what's happening. Like they are only violent and manhandling because they might have met one of the criminals in the past uh the whole it's never dealt with and they're just like we did that right like it, it's a very uncomfortable scene greg uh for me uh it's just when um jack just says watermelon <laughs> like, <laughs> i think he is calling reggie watermelon and i don't honestly think that's how that works i think like like you can do racism with that word in that way but i don't think you can just say it to somebody like <laughs> i think you have to and in a way i i almost that might be the point of the movie that like racism is so stupid that like when people use it they don't even find a creative way to use it right. they don't even find like some way to be funny they just like say whatever it is um but like it just seemed like unpleasantness on like on top of all the other unpleasantness just watermelon <laughs> this one's tough because I, uh you guys picked representatives of the misogyny and the racism mm-hmm. and i do think that the movie handles misogyny worse so i'm giving that one to mike <laughs> also a mike. N- new cringe moment will be uh the new drop that's just greg's like, <laughs> watermelon <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> don't ever talk on a podcast greg it <laughs> might be a drop soon but i'm a white man <laughs> uh greg walter hill Coming off the Warriors, about to make uh, Streets of Fire, made 48 Hours. What is? What do you think is the director's signature moment? It's got to be that police station shot. The one Yeah. Um, it's because it's it does that thing where it got near the end of the shot. And I was like, wait, has this all been one shot? And I kind of rewrite it in my head. And I'm like, yeah, that's why he made these choices. But in that in the moment where it's happening, you almost don't notice that it's a long one or because it's you just get the feeling of the shot without noticing the shot. And that's always the dream, right? That you make somebody get the message without being like, oh, I see what you did there. I did right at the very end pick up on it. But before then, I was just like, man, there's a lot of activity going on here. This police station is a very active place. 
I do sort of think that Walter Hill destroyed his own career with this movie because I think that he was like, I can show both sides of men. I understand men. I will only show men. I can show both sides of men. Men of any color. And then creating the Eddie Murphy character, which then created the new action hero, sort of fucked him. <laughs> but uh, I do think that we have this, and I do think that that scene shows that. Mike, what do you got? Uh, so many directors have muses, right? Uh, Scorsese had De Niro and then DiCaprio. I think the Safdie brothers have one. The uh, Safdie brothers, they have a muse. Uh, <laughs> Wes Anderson had Bill Murray. Uh, uh, this director has David Patrick Kelly, who plays Luther, who's like the go-between between Eddie Murphy and James Remar. And then in The Warriors, he, David Patrick Kelly, played a character named Luther, who would famously say, Warriors, come out and oh, play. Oh, shit, that's him? Uh, so this guy, if, 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 if what, Walter Hill, is that his name? The director? Uh-huh. If Walter Hill is making a movie, David Patrick Kelly is going to play Luther <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> That's a good find, Mike. Right. <laughs> and finally, Mike, and I feel like I know your answer for this, uh, but pound for pound performance, who was able to take this movie away? Well, you know, it's I'm going to say David Patrick Kelly. Is that? Yeah, David <laughs> Patrick Kelly. It's it, the DPK. It is. Uh, I would love to say it's the DPK, and I think he does a serviceable job, but it is uh, impossible to watch this movie and not be in awe of 20-year-old Eddie Murphy. Greg? Yeah, I got to I got to agree. Um he just carries so many scenes. He really saves the movie from just being like racist claptrap. And the more involved his character gets in the movie, the better the movie is. Mm-hmm. All the way right up until the end and it's like really I don't think there is much hope for Nick Nolte's character Jack, but I think that the hope is imbued in Reggie like Reggie gets the messages that Jack never will Jack just knows that like Reggie has gotten them because that's how Jack arcs um and all of that I really no matter how much of it was actually in the script Eddie Murphy found the life in that Mm. like making this movie must have been a real like must have been a real life version of being in that bar scene like a whole bunch of white people around you and they all have a certain way they want you to act and you have to give them enough to where they're okay with it, but not too much where they get riled, right? And so, like, he manages to navigate all of that. And, I mean, imagine being Eddie Murphy with the, those execs, because you have some execs saying, uh, I don't even care if you do have a badge, N-word, even though he's a cop. In, as far as he knows, he's a cop in there. Like, that's how people, I don't care how popular you right. are. Yeah. And then there's other execs trying to just run out of the building, like a different redneck from that scene. <laughs> And him just having the faith. The other thing that's amazing about this performance is that maybe it was all edited out. I don't know. But so many things Nick Dolte says where Eddie Murphy doesn't have a comeback because he knows he can't. Because he knows that would put him back in jail. That right. would get the shit kicked out of him. Like, he just sits there quietly and waits for his moment. You know? Like, it's very impressive. Uh, but Mike said it first. Mike. Greg. What a weird system. Recommendation? Based on 48 hours. Uh, if you liked 48 Hours, I think you're going to want to watch a show called 24. Uh, this is from like 2001, 2002, uh, as uh, Kiefer Sutherland as Jack Bauer, who has 24 hours to <laughs> uh, stop terrorism. And he fills that 24 hours with a lot of questionable ways, uh, perhaps racist ways, some could even say. Uh, but he still manages to get the job done in half of the time that was needed in this movie. Both running time and actual in-universe time. 24. Check it out. You won't be sad. And that's 24, but those are hours, right? It's yeah, like, like months. they don't say hours in the, in the show, but it's pretty much you can watch the minutes ticking by and you're like, no, this is going to add up to 24 hours. So, right. Yeah. And that uh, includes commercials? Was that clock running? No, it would, yeah. They would be like, <laughs> Jack would be like, oh, I'm going to drive to Santa Monica. And then they would go to commercial and they would show you the time was running. And then when you came back, there would be time that was gone. Smart. So he just would like reflect on like ExxonMobil during oh, I'm going to take a fat dump commercials. <laughs> that was, so many people had a problem or a bit with how little dumps Jack Bauer <laughs> took. Yeah. They really love talking about how that. My favorite supposed thing. supposed to wank off. My favorite thing was just, <laughs> wait, you, you can, can go 24 hours? You can go 24 hours when there's a terrorist <laughs> in your city, Mike, to not jerk off. My daughter's been kidnapped. I got to go <laughs> rub one out and then get on this case. I only have 24 hours. 
bum, I don't know bum, what bum, porn bum. site you're on, Mike, but I would like the name, please, as soon as possible. Mike, what is your recommendation? Uh, if you like crimes and thrillers uh, and cops make you uncomfortable and cops that don't look like here is what they'll make you uncomfortable, I recommend uh, the entire Bosch series. You can watch Titus Welver play Bosch on Amazon Prime Show Bosch, but I would say start with The Black Hole, Michael Connelly's first Bosch book, Bosch. Uh, and uh, my re- I didn't give any awards, but um, I would like to yes. recommend something right now. Um, just the whole buddy cop thing really came to its peak, I would say. I've, uh, the whole white person, black person just being equal finally in 1991's The Last Boy Scout, where <laughs> Bruce Willis and Damon Wayans uh, were a perfect pairing. I heard of that movie. Ryan. When we come back, <laughs> we're going to talk about this movie's chances for winning the 1982 movie of the year and your two's chances of winning this episode. Gentlemen, 48 Hours is in the books. And I don't know, that was a ride. Uh, You guys thought very differently of it, but I am very glad that we watched it. Does it have a shot of becoming 1982's movie of the year? I don't think it does because Greg exists. Sorry again, everybody. Though yeah, it is I just arguably I, 82. Did we I feel Greg uh I don't know, make it seem more important or interesting? I feel like we did a good job or you did a good job and it 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 moved me a little bit highlighting what is good about the movie. Um and so I definitely think there are more high points than after my initial viewing and I like it more than I than I did at the start of the show, but I wouldn't say it has any chance it would it would need to have three enthusiastic boys instead we just have (laughs) two pretty enthusiastic boys and one poopy pants boy me so i'm gonna say no it's hard with a uh season that has et and blade runner to consider anything else um all right so we have the totals greg you had 27 points Woo! and i can't remember is that good no not really not really (laughs) i would say uh i would say like 30 and above is good. Anything under 30 is a pretty bad score. Mike, you had 31. So oh, there you go. Congratulations, Mike. Uh, I would love a variety of muffins dropped at my doorstep every morning every for the next morning. week. Um, there are three different types of muffins that I do not like. I will not tell mm. you what they are. I just do not want them included in the basket. Dude, you'll never get a banana nut from me. That is not one of them. Banana nut's a quality muffin. That's a good really? one, dude. It, you know what? Fuck that. There's no bad muffin. Any I food, like that. A, any food in muffin form, I am down with. All right, guys. Skinny spinach muffin coming your way. I'm so glad that I watched 19. I'm so glad I watched this 1982 <laughs> movie with you. Uh, 48 <laughs> hours, uh, but we have so many crazy shows left. We have the aforementioned Blade Runner and ET. We have Fast Times. We have Fitzcarraldo. We have all of the new bonus movies like Das Boot and The Verdict. We pumped. Are we getting ready so for yeah, 1982? Oh, yeah. 82. I'm looking forward to every other movie that, that we're doing. That, it, that does not star Nick Nolte. <laughs> yeah, no Nick Nolte's. I'm looking forward to Greg realizing 1982 was a disgusting year and its movies reveled in its disgustingness. <laughs> That's not true. They're like uh, some, some of the movies we're watching are like ladies, people, just like the fellas. And I, that, I look forward to movies that understand the personhood of women again. Well, on that note, (laughs) my name is Ryan. Thank you so much for tuning in. That is Mike. That is Greg. And remember, please, keep watching those movies.